everything. Drop it. Come on. Don't take your hand. Oh. Holy f Holy f Holy f Oh my f God We're in Toronto We just landed Our plane crashed It's upside down Fire department's on site Upside down. It's Delta Airlines Flight 4819, all 80 on board okay, mostly with minor injuries, according to the airport CEO. And hats off to the fire crews, the pilots, the flight attendants, even the passengers for evacuating this plane very quickly. You can see in some of the videos that they used the overhead bins essentially as the walkway. That became the floor as they tried to get out of this plane through some of the overwing exits that were turned into essentially underwing exits if the right wing was still there. That completely sheared off along with the tail of this airplane. The big questions now, how did this airplane end up on its back? Because the flight tracking data shows a relatively normal approach as this plane was coming in. Stabilized on the glide path, on speed and altitude, Things looked okay. It's the last few seconds, the few the last few moments that are the big mystery now, and that's what investigators are really trying to drill down on at this very early stage of this investigation. I want to bring in CNN safety analyst and former FAA safety inspector David Susi. David, to the, to the point that uh, that Rich Request was just making. The, it's almost miraculous that, and based on the team that was in the plane, the safety uh, kind of elements that are on the plane, the fact that at this point in time, there's no loss of life. There are 15 injuries, two that are critical. Uh, are you surprised by that? Uh, you know, uh, everybody keeps saying it's miraculous that there are no fatalities, but I've had a little bit of a different perspective in that I was present at the 1987 crash of a DC-9 in Denver, which was on its way out and it ended up crashing on the runway and flipping over upside down. And at that time, these seats, these 16G seats were not on that DC-9, nor were the breakaway wings. It wasn't designed to break away. So the wings were still on the aircraft at the time this aircraft was upside down with passengers in it. So at that time, there were 25 fatalities that we were not able to get out of the aircraft in time. And the weight of those wings were continuing to crush down on people still in the airplane that couldn't get out. So to be able to see this now, basically a recurrent, the same number of people, almost 80, airplane, 80 people, to be able to get out of there without any injuries is pure testament to all of the work that the NTSB and the FAA and all the regulators and everyone involved with the design of the aircraft has pr made this a survivable accident. I saw it happen in 87 and it was not survivable by 25 people. I see it today and it is survivable. So is it a mir miracle or is it just good, smart, hard work by the regulators and by the NTSB and trying to get aircraft to be safer and safer and safer continuously. Uh, I want to expand on this because it, it's, it, there are fascinating elements and obviously your personal experience is extraordinarily helpful in explaining them because when I first saw these photos beyond uh, the bizarre a plane is upside down moment, it was there are no wings. And then you saw the video that we showed, if we can pull it back up again with the smoke just the billowing black smoke uh, that signified fire, I thought this looks terrible in every single way. A and on some level, you're saying this is exactly how it was supposed to happen based on regulatory changes and structural changes that have occurred over the course of the last couple of decades. Yeah, it sounds like a strange perspective, but I really what I'm talking about is the uh, capability of mitigating loss of life. That's what the purpose of the FAA is and the purpose of the NTSB and our accident investigations is to save lives. And that's what's happened here. So when I see this now, you brought up the smoke and that does raise some very big concerns for me about how this happened. Initially, I thought, as most of us did, there was a crosswind. But this aircraft is is certified. It has demonstrated its ability to land in direct crosswinds at 35 knots. So unless some surprise gust came up, which is possible, but when you look at that smoke, you see that the smoke wasn't there until it was on the runway. The runway 
the smoke started at the impact point from what I can tell. And so that I'd start looking at a couple of things. Number one is I would look at the landing gear because if the landing gear is still in the wheel wells, if it's still on the aircraft and it wasn't out and got ripped off when it, when it turned upside down or sideways, that tells me that that landing gear may not have been fully extended. So as an investigator, that would be one of the first things I look at is when did that smoke start? Did it start on impact, which would tell me that the, the impact was so significant that it either collapsed the landing gear or caused the engines to come down, which would have started a fire in that connecting point for the engines and caused that large amount of smoke that came out. That doesn't just happen from landing and getting sideways on the airport on the on the uh, runway. So there's a lot of investigation that needs to be done. I'm not saying that is what happened, but as an investigator, an experienced investigator, those are a few of the things that I would look at first, Matt. Can, can I take a step back just to the point that Pete was making that, you know, given this incident, multiple smaller incidents we've heard about in just the past few weeks, obviously a much larger incident here in the U.S., the tragic deadly DCA crash, uh, there's been firing of personnel at the FAA. Uh, your point about uh, regulations and the effectiveness of kind of the government action here, what's your sense of this moment for the airline industry for uh, flights and flight safety? Well, what I want to caution about, Matt, is that when we look at a short period of time uh, in aviation, you have to understand that the, the, the litmus test here is a personal decision on your part. Do you feel safe? Now, when you're trying to make that decision, do I feel safe flying? And, and I do very much so. There's no trend. There's nothing that ties these accidents together. So using critical thinking, you can say for yourself, do all of these things indicate some kind of trend in aircraft accidents? And to me, as an experienced investigator and being in, involved in aviation as a mechanic and as a safety inspector for the FAA, I'm perfect. I feel perfectly safe doing this. I don't see anything tying these together that says, oh, the FAA is bad or the system is a problem. There are incidents that are a problem. And so it's, it's real hard to, as a flying person, I get emails all the time and calls from people that say, it's not safe. It can't be right now. Even from pilots saying, what's going on with aviation right now? And to me, I, I still feel safe. You have to look at the thousands and tens of thousands of flights that happen every single day without incident and balance that. But again, it comes down to your personal decision. If you don't feel safe flying, do not feel, do not fly. But if you do feel safe and you feel like uh, you're ready to go, take, take trust and take faith in the fact that there are thousands of people like myself that de dedicated their life, their entire life to making things safer and making make it more survivable when there is a, a critical failure of this kind. Yeah, extremely important to point out, there is no connective tissue between kind of all of these various incidents, at least no. that I have seen uh, at this point. David Susi, always appreciate your time, sir. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matt.